This is the impressive Italian frontage of Chester Railway Station. Built in 1848, it is the second station to sit on this site. Today, in 2023, it operates on a much reduced scale compared to previous times, but still offers services to Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, North and South Wales, and if you're lucky, even London. In times past, the number of destinations was far more varied, with many services venturing over routes which no longer exist. One such line headed west along the North Wales Coast Main Line, before heading inland at Saltney, before passing through the beautiful Welsh countryside en route to the towns of Mould and Denby. The Chester to Denby Railway was initially comprised of two separate railways. The Mould Railway began operating between Chester and Mould in 1849, whilst the Mould and Denby Junction Railway operated between Mould and Denby from 1869. As well as passenger services, the line attracted considerable activity by freight workings. Both companies became part of the London and North Western Railway before in 1923 under the regrouping the London Midland and Scottish Railway took over running. Apart from Mould and Denby the line's other stations were located in sparsely populated and rural areas and suffered from low passenger numbers. In 1962, and now run by the London Midland region of British Railways, trains only ran from Monday to Saturday, and with just a handful of return trips, passenger services were withdrawn. Freight, however, continued, but this was also systematically withdrawn over the years, with all services ceasing in 1983. Before we put boots on the ground, I'd like to take a look at the National Library of Scotland maps. Dated 1898, Chester General Station is vast. The term general is suffixed so as to differentiate it from the nearby Northgate Station, which I covered in my Connors Quay and Chester Railway series. This map represents a period when the railways nationwide were at their zenith, with Chester being no exception numbering 14 platforms compared to today's seven. The area I'm concentrating on is here, the western end, known as the western bays where the former platforms one to three would have been found. Unfortunately, the map shows the extent of the train shed roof, so we cannot see the platforms below. So to remedy that, let's zoom in and jump forward to today. So the first thing that's noticeable is that the station car park now occupies the entire area once covered by platforms 1 to 3 and various sidings. However, I've been lucky enough to have received a track diagram among many other photos and invaluable pieces of information of Chester's western end by Roger Carvel, the author of the magnificent Irwell Press publication The Chester to Denby Railway. My grateful thanks to him. This diagram is dated to approximately 1955 and if I lay that onto today's view we get a good idea of the former track layout. Thanks to this it's also possible to plot the almost exact positions of the bay platforms. So from top to bottom we have the former platform 3, today still in operation platform 2, the now disappeared former platform 2 and lastly and most importantly for our purposes the former platform 1, the Mould Bay, where services to and from Mould and Denby arrived and departed. Aside from the platforms, another feature to the south of Platform 1 was the horse landing area, which was for the purpose of allowing horses to be loaded and unloaded onto trains before the use of road vehicles became more popular. It was also a facility which was no doubt very busy during Chester race days. If we now remove the track diagram and leave the platform positions, it shows exactly where those platforms were upon today's landscape. 
This is platform two at the current Chester station. It's formerly platform three, which used to form part of the Western Bays. It's the only still operational part of the Western Bays, but in its entirety, the platform where you can see it curves off to the right there, used to go straight on towards Hall Bridge. Over there, we've got where used to be platform two. We've got the original supporting wall for the train shed. And as we walk down platform two, unfortunately there's not a service in it at the moment so if we look over there we've got the the arches with that haven't been filled in that is the area where the former platform one used to be at the uh the mold bay station this is the concourse of chester station in 2022 and with its train shed it looks much as it has done for the countless years we turn the other direction we walk out onto the site of the former western bays and we've got the wall here and this is the site of the former platform number two platform three was over there which was today's platform two now looking up on the wall we've got some fantastic signage that still exists i'll try and decipher it a bit later if i walk a little bit further up here We've got another one and once again i'll try and decipher what it says it's very faint today let's have a look at these signs and i'm surprised they still exist considering this part of the station was closed some 55 years ago now the print has weathered over the years but i can make out the wording second class refreshment room and the wonderful part of this sign is the pointing finger visible on the pillar to the right The second sign is less legible. The first two words are clearly first class. The next one I cannot make out, but it may begin with a W. Then we have refreshment room at the other end. So we clearly have directions to the first and second class refreshment rooms. We're looking east towards the main concourse and with the train shed supporting wall here, and the other there, it shows the extent of where the roof used to come out to. Coming out this far and beyond, it really was vast. Over here is the site of the buffers of platform number one, the platform used by our Mould and Denby services. Today, it's a bit of a storage area, but if I lift the camera over the fence, and interestingly, we can see a bit of a tiled area and some steps. Let's see if we can get a bit of a closer look. And there you can clearly see white tiles and some lovely worn steps. Have a look at this photo from the BR and OPC collection and it shows a fabulous image of the former Platform 2 and the buffers of the former Platform 1. Look just to the left of the buffers and behind a wall you can see a white tiled area. Now, this area is probably a toilet. But are these the same white tiles visible in today's view? Continuing west into the car park I'm walking along the ghost of the former platform too. Now the train shed supporting wall used to come out this far and it was approximately in line with the fronts of the cars that you can see to my left and it's worth noting that these platforms stretched almost as far as Hall Bridge which you can see at the far end of the car park
this area today is a modern business, nothing to do with a railway. But pre-1960s, it was known as the horse landing stage, and it's where horses would have been brought to the area, probably for race days, and they was unloaded from trains and then loaded back on again. Today, there's nothing to see of that area other than the original station architecture. But over here, something I'm quite intrigued with, and it's this gate, it's rather ornate, made carved out of the sandstone or rather sandstone blocks and i'm wondering if this is the original gate that was used by those horses back in the day so once departing chester our platforms on the western bays would have come out to approximately here maybe a few feet further in fact but the lines would have narrowed so that they could fit under this part of Hall Road Bridge here. And if I just pop the camera over the fence, we should get a clearer view. And there we go. So our trains used to depart there. The line would then turn off to the left and it would join today's uh, line, which goes out towards Shrewsbury and North Wales. Standing upon Hall Bridge and looking east upon the car park, it gives a good impression of the area taken up by the Western Bay platforms, from the wall on the right occupied by the horse landing stage and other sidings, to Platform 1, our Mold Bay, and then Platforms 2 and 3, echoing to the sound of Great Western Expresses arriving and departing almost a lifetime ago. Well, I've crossed onto the opposite side of Hall Bridge now, and our trains, after departing Chester to Molden Denby, would have travelled beneath this bridge. Now, coming through here in front of me, and then into the fenced-off area, and looking at the track beyond that fence, that's the North Wales main line. And our line would have joined up on the opposite side of the fence, going through here, and it must be noted that the infrastructure of the past in this area was purely railway. In the distance over there is the Transport for Wales Chester Maintenance Depot. So at least we have some railway industry still existing today. Everywhere here, over this side, where today's post office sits, was railway workshop, wagon, coach and loco repair shops. Over there, more maintenance depots and track depots to maintain the permanent way. It was all a huge railway infrastructure and as with the station alas it's now a shadow of its former self as we leave chester general we'll return to the 1898 map once more now as our route for the next few miles still follows an operating railway rather than investigating every single point of interest as i would had the line been abandoned I'll simply show some of the more prominent features of the line. Those which the trains departing Chester for Mould and Denby would have passed through or over. Now here we can see Hull Road Bridge. This is where we investigated last and our line passes under the bridge before joining up with the North Wales main line. It then curves southwest away from Chester. This line, incidentally, is the line to Wirral and Birkenhead, and obviously Liverpool today. Well, this line here is the Chester General Avoiding Line, once again to Wirral and Birkenhead. Back to our featured line, and the first feature we come to are the tunnels beneath Chester Northgate Station, which are situated here. I'm standing upon the eastern portal of Windmill Lane Tunnel, looking towards Chester. Behind me would have been the former Northgate Station, which would have crossed over our line at exactly this point, and all of its associated sidings and sheds. 
and the same location but looking west this time at the twin portals of Northgate Street Tunnel. Standing upon the elevated areas of Chester's inner ring road allows a good vantage point of the western portals of Northgate Tunnel. An interesting feature of the route for our crew and passengers on their way to Malden Denby would have been the impressive flight of Northgate Locks and the bridge crossing the main line of the Shropshire Union Canal. Here, looking down upon the canal bridge, I'm standing upon the far northwest corner of Chester's city walls. Somewhat controversially, it punctures this structure twice before leaving the city centre. Reducing to just an up and down line at Rudy Junction, the line sits atop an elevated section and an impressive viaduct as we skirt the western side of the racecourse. Here we cross the River Dee heading southwest. In 1847 this was the scene of a disaster when the then bridge collapsed as a train crossed over it. Only the locomotive cleared the span in time as the rest of the train fell into the river below, resulting in a number of fatalities. Looking down onto the River Dee Bridge from up on Curzon Park Bridge, you can clearly see that the two lines that are left have been lifted. These were the original Hollyhead main up and down, with the former Great Western lines remaining. Standing atop here, back in the day, you could have witnessed London Expresses travelling in opposite directions, with Great Western trains heading west towards Shrewsbury and Paddington, and London and North Western services heading east towards Chester, Crewe and Euston. Looking west, the line enters a deep cutting here, and we look towards a footbridge which today leads to Chester Golf Club. We now come to Saltney Junction, where the line to Wrexham and Shrewsbury branches south, seen here as the furthest line at the top of the picture. Our line continues to follow the main line west, crossing the border into Wales. This is River Lane in Saltney. The bridge in front of us carries our railway as it meanders its way towards Saltney Ferry. Today it's just a road that takes traffic into an industrial estate, but prior to that, these roads were railway lines feeding the various industries that would have been situated along the River Dee, just a few yards ahead of us up there. The overhead view shows River Lane in Saltney, with Saltney Junction just to the right of the picture. Today, the line threads through a busy industrial area served by roads. Let's go back to 1897 and the scene changes drastically. Still a heavily industrialised area, but then all served by railways. And as I said, the bridge crosses a number heading north to the River Dee. I'm standing on the bridge at Saltney Ferry and this is the site of our first station. Now if you look at the track we're looking towards Chester that way and where the track bends round and goes to my left here just after the bend our trains would have come off at a junction and would have branched off over onto the right hand side here. Now if you look at the tyre grooves in the grass there where the track maintenance uh, vehicles have been driving that pretty much is bang on where the Chester line the Chester bound line used to come from Mould, Mould Junction which is just behind us the Mould line would have been more or less where that tree that silver birch is and our station would have been right down there this whole area 
right up until the 1980s there was a hive of railway activity and if you look over there there's still a small reminder where you can see some sidings nestling amongst the trees So I've now turned to look in the down direction here at Saltney Ferry and what I'm looking at is the former station entrance and you can see it there between the two pillars, one pillar there, one pillar there and the stonework has been filled in the gap. Now let's cross the road. So you can see our entrance there and passengers would have gone through there and down some steps onto the platform down there. Now you can see there is absolutely nothing left to see today. The mole bound line would have run through those trees there and the Chester bound line through those trees going under the bridge. And our single island platform, it wouldn't have been a substantial thing, probably only able to accommodate four or five coaches at most. Now despite being situated on the main line, Saltney Ferry was only served by Mould and Denby services and it opened in 1891 and was a relative newcomer to the line which had itself opened some 42 years previously. Now this station was perfectly located for Mould Junction engine shed and it served as a drop-off and pick-up point for the many staff employed there over the years. This photo from 1950 shows the station's single island platform looking up the line towards Chester. While here, in the opposite direction, the down line to Mould is clearly visible and shows just how close the locomotive shed was. Finally, along with the rest of the line, Saltney Ferry Station closed in 1962. Now as I said earlier, Saltney Ferry and its surrounding areas was a huge railway area right up until the 1980s full of yards and sidings. The brickwork that you see there between the trees is the remains of Mould Junction Locomotive Depot and we've fortunately been given access to have a look round. So let's go and have a look at that. So this in front of me is what's left of Mould Junction Motive Power Depot and it closed in April 1966 and I actually came here a couple of years ago in 2020 when this was the view from the track entrance. As you can see the shed was fully extent then. Unfortunately it's now in the process of demolition and luckily I could get close up to film what was left.